Why do we benefit so much when we focus on Bitcoin and Bitcoin only? No stocks, no cryptos, altcoins, no real estate, nothing else like that. We focus completely and only on Bitcoin. And why do we actually really benefit from that? Why isn't it a good idea to diversify your time and your financial energy? Maybe the stocks, maybe the real estate, maybe to, I don't know, Solana, Ethereum or any other altcoin out there. And that's what I really got into with Dani. She interviewed me a few months back where I was at my old studio. And I hope you enjoyed this interview where Dani was an amazing host and you hopefully get some value out of this. Let me know what you think in the comment section. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Heartbeat Podcast, where we delve into the heart of Bitcoin and uncover the sweet spot for enthusiasts worldwide. I'm Danny, your fellow Bitcoin explorer, and today we will be joined by Robin Sire, a Bitcoin podcast host who has been in the scene for quite a while now. He's had an opportunity to interview a lot of people, and today we're going to talk with him a little bit about his journey. How are you? Hi, Danny. I'm, uh, I'm really, really good. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing to be on the other side. Like I have a daily Bitcoin podcast show, uh, as you mentioned, and I usually interview every day uh, tomorrow i have a weird schedule with a uh, free podcast in a row with like half an hour in between so this will be challenge challenging for me uh but usually like uh, i'm doing every day a podcast interview and i have people on from like uh jeff booth natalie brunel uh, even gary cadone recently uh the the, the bigger guys on, on on social media but also the everyday kind of a guy like just like if if someone replies to my tweet and i'm like oh that's an interesting reply uh i just i don't do a lot of checking i'm like dming him like hey do you want to be on my show and let's record and this these are usually the the episodes that i love the most because there i get to know someone new that i get to know someone that is not the not not on every podcast because like a Jeff Booth, uh, Michael Saylor, uh, Natalie Brunel, they are on every podcast and I heard them like 20, 30 times uh, saying uh, Bitcoin stuff. And so I, I love to have the new guys, uh, the someone that is, was on, never on a podcast. I had, I think uh, I made now 106 episodes uh, and I think 10 or 15 of, of those were the first time ever on a podcast with me. So this is really, really cool to have have completely new faces in the Bitcoin community to have to spread the world a little bit uh, further. That's really interesting you mentioned that because uh, over the weekend, I was thinking that I was interested in interviewing uh, people who maybe don't know that much about Bitcoin, or Bitcoin, like the actual users, to get a better sense of where people get lost, where people get apprehension, and kind of like to basically orange pill people on camera. <laughs> And, and you have to get them as and and when you explain bitcoin like if you get bitcoin explained by someone you want someone that is relatable to you uh, and this is where we have to get really diverse with, with our uh, with our guests uh, if we if we have someone uh, sitting in india uh, someone that is indian and explains him Bitcoin is way better and may, way more relatable as some American guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so like I, I'm trying to just have the widest range of, 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 of uh, people on my Bitcoin uh, show that is, is possible. I cannot do more than one a day. Uh, like one a day is my, my upper limit. Uh, it's maybe maybe too much, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with the schedule that I set myself. Uh, but it's a really, really cool uh, thing to do. Yeah. And we, we need more people uh, in the Bitcoin uh, scene. Like we are so, so small and so early. Uh, everyone that starts a podcast, everyone that starts speaking about it, everyone, every voice is so important that speaks up. Earlier, you said 106 episodes, but this morning I was looking at your YouTube again and it said exactly 100 episodes. I was wondering if maybe some have not become available, but because of that, I was uh, thinking of celebrating this as like your 100 episode retrospect since it like kind of coincided and with like you being interviewed. There, There's two aspects to it. First of all, like I pre-record stuff. 
so like I have episodes that are not have been uh, uploaded till now, but there is also the aspect where I uh, already deleted two episodes, uh, which is not because of me, it's just because they said, oh, they don't want it anymore. Uh, uh, someone said it uh, right uh, after I released it, and then I just took it off uh, because he said he's involved in investment stuff and in se uh, investment series, and he does not want to have anything that gets in the way of, of getting an investment right now. Um, I don't like if someone says like delete my episodes, I'm deleting, of course. Like I don't, I don't care. Like the 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 my shows are for the guest. Uh, and someone uh, also wanted to delete it because he wants to be more private, uh, and I respect that decision, and uh, it's 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 totally fine. It, I mean, the the la la later one was on for like a few months, so uh, I, I looked at the statistics. This episode did not get any views in the last week, anyway. So, but uh, still, like I respect this. Uh, so there could be a, a difference there, uh, but uh, the bigger difference is because I had pre. Uh, record and uh, pre-record everything uh, and then release it like a week later, two weeks later, a few days later, depending on, on how far I'm ahead in the schedule. And yeah, I, I, I released my 100th episode, I think on Saturday. Uh, so today was my 102nd release or 101st release, something like that. So we, we can definitely make a 100th episode retrospect because we are right around the, the 100 episodes right now. Yeah, I think it's still a great opportunity to celebrate the 100 episodes and like the trajectory and the path, like the things you have learned and what you've discovered on the way. So I have a couple questions related to that. The first question I had is, who has taught you the, the most in these 100 episodes? Who taught you the most? Oh, <laughs> uh, wow, that's, uh, that's really hard to pinpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, you can pick there... a there, there are uh, a lot of different uh, that that learned me a lot. Um, I think Jeff Booth was the most influential on in my life, honestly, uh, because uh, I interviewed him in a very interesting point in my life where I just was in the in the transition uh, to being from part time working in in uh, sales for an IT company and doing part time the podcast. To going full time to podcast and doing only this, uh, and uh, he said, like I, I did not speak with him about that, but he just said in the end of the podcast, uh, even like live while we were rec recording, he said that um, you benefit massively if you spend all your uh, time right now in Bitcoin, not only your financial energy but also your time in Bitcoin. Uh, and he explained it yourself, himself that he, even though he was invested in Bitcoin, he spent all this time with this fiat system money and stuff like that a fear in the fiat system where he was involved. And he one time stood up and was like, I'm, I'm like benefiting the fiat system. He is speaking about Bitcoin. He had this book already out, but he was not really outspoken, uh, um, um, not really spending his time in Bitcoin. And then he decided to do the, the what is it called, ego death capital uh, and spending his time really on uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and this kind of uh, was one of the major reasons why I also like took the step. Like there are a lot of reasons why I took the step and I wanted to took the step and take the step this year. I had it planned way later. Like I wanted to do it like September, October at uh, this range, but I ended up doing it already in February, uh, which was a surprise to me uh, because things were just happening way faster than than I expected. This is also part to uh, 21 Bitcoin believing in me and sponsoring me really early on, um, making it happen for me, the, the transition. So I think uh, this was... Uh, I think I did not learn the much um, the most from Jeff Booth, uh, but uh, from Jeff Booth, the had the most influence on my life. Maybe um, the most learnings. I think I the, this is this is really hard to pinpoint. It's a really good question. I did not thought about it. Uh, and actually, I'm I'm planning on doing a, a book on on my podcast episodes because I'm interviewing so many people. Uh, a book that is like what Bitcoin taught me. 
uh, where I also uh, have the learnings from my guests in. Uh, so if I started with the book, I probably had a better answer already. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but this is this is an, an interesting uh, uh, thought about. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question that is similar, but I was curious if you would say the same person or not, because the other question I had is who surprised you the most? Or who, or what surprised you the most? Who gave you the piece of information that was like the most, the most unexpected or who came on your show and was the most unexpected? Those are uh, definitely, this is definitely not Jeff Booth because I knew him before quite good. And, and uh, this is what I was talking a little bit earlier because the, the bigger guys, y- you already know what they're saying. Like uh, when you ask Jeff Booth a question, you kind of know where he's going, like what he's saying and stuff like this, because he's he's on so many podcasts. Um, but one that was really fascinating for me uh, was Luke uh, that I interviewed recently as a basketball uh, a player, professional one. Uh, and uh, he was just really good in uh, speaking about Bitcoin and about his passion. And it was his first podcast. It was fascinating for me because if you interview people that are the first time on a podcast, uh, it's also a little bit uh, like, like like a gamble because they could be really uh, nervous. They could be really, um, yeah, they, it's the first time. Maybe they are not uh, um not as good in articulating uh, things uh, as there might be like a Michael Saylor, Jeff Booth and stuff like that. Uh, So it's a little bit of a gamble. So the host like me has to do more work on making them comfortable. Uh, If someone is completely new, I usually spend more time before the podcast, like 10, 15, sometimes in 20 minutes speaking with them uh, and then just starting the recording and and keeping really friendly uh, with Jeff Booth. I was like, yeah, he's in. Press record. Let's go. <laughs> like, I'm definitely taking notes from your techniques. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think a, a host uh, has the the job of of getting the best out of the guest. Like this is uh, like get, get getting um, like it's not it's it's easy to get the best out of like a really good speaker because he's prepared. Like he did it so many times. He know what he's doing. Uh, he he already said the things he want to say like 50 times before he he says it's on the podcast or maybe like 100 times uh and someone that is new like i had one guy on uh that i will not say his name but uh, uh he was on and we uh, took two uh two sets like we we take t- t- the podcast like 30 hours uh, 30 minutes half an hour and then we said okay let's delete it uh let's do the same thing just over again and then we did uh, 45 minutes and it was actually a really good performing podcast because he had extremely good things to say and i w- was loving his opinion uh and uh it was it was uh, amazing to see when when people are coming over this this hurdle of oh i can actually freely speak i can that that's what in my that's what in my what is in my mind i can actually pronounce and put it into the world and it is something that resonates with people and every episode is resonating with other people like sometimes uh, i think like oh this episode is not as interesting and then it performs really good because i'm just one person maybe the 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 episode or the guest was not as interesting for me personally but it could be really interesting for someone listening uh, so I don't try to judge my 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 own episodes or my own guests, and I just try to uh, do like one hour of of pre uh, um, preparation before the guest comes on. So I'm prepared uh, what his life is all about, what he is doing. Obviously, with uh, people that are more on the internet, it's easier because you find stuff. If if someone is not active, then it's really hard to find stuff. <laughs> And yeah. he only had 200 uh, followers and he is not doing a lot. Uh, but even th- those I have on and those are the, the most uh, cool, uh, the most amazing episodes usually. As as with Luke, uh, it's not re- released till now, but probably when this is released, it will be released. Uh, so uh, it was really, really cool to just like talk with, with random people uh, and and yeah, get the, get the interesting, the new uh, po- point of views of, of Bitcoin out. Yeah, because I do feel like there's been a shift in society because before 
like uh, it would maybe be uncomfortable to talk about Bitcoin in certain social environments or if you brought it up, they make all those memes about bringing it up at the family table and all that stuff. But like now I feel it's like uh, even in my own social environment, I'm OK talking about Bitcoin, talking about working in Bitcoin because everything has become more like formal and it's becoming normalized every day. More. we are growing up this is this is the thing that uh we we are seeing more and more in the bitcoin world we are actually growing up and the bitcoin community is now ready to be in all the get-togethers in all the restaurant discussions in all the bar discussions like everybody knows bitcoin and those fats that we usually have to deal with they are getting smaller. Like the the environment fat is at least in my uh, Austrian environment is still big, but it gets smaller. And people are like, oh yes, it uses a lot of energy. But people are like, kind of yeah, we have to deal with it. Uh, but it's like they don't understand why Bitcoin is useful, so they still have the, those those fats in their in their head. But it it gets better. Like uh, it gets way better. And also when I see it in the family, uh, when I first adopted it in four uh, four years ago. I was the only one in, in Bitcoin. I was the only weird one in, in, in Bitcoin. And it was for the family totally okay. And they knew it because I was only the also the only one that was investing in stocks that were unusual. Uh, and I always put like big bets on, on stocks. I, ha I had a lot of uh, money, uh, like a lot of my money, not a lot of money, but a lot of uh, like a high percentage of my money in Tesla stock. Uh, before I had it in Bitcoin, uh, so they uh, they were like, "Oh, Robin, he is like having really high risk stocks and he really high risk bets," which I always disagreed with. Uh, but with Tesla, they kind of uh, were, were right. Uh, I mean, I made a, a huge amount of, of money because I was lucky, honestly, because I did not really understand the stock market uh, back then. Uh, but this pushed me to Bitcoin, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. So like my my environment reacted really good to Bitcoin. Like nobody like was like, yeah, Bitcoin. Uh, but uh, this is also like, this is a, a point where I'm also, um, I'm always really healthy. I'm trying to to look out for myself. Uh, and so I'm, I'm looked up to in, in my family sometimes. Uh, and this is where I'm really passionate about. Like when you are um, in, in your life really good, like you are, kind and nice to everyone and you're happy with your life and you're doing good this is the best orange pilling you can do people uh driving towards you like if if you are just doing really good in life you're happy you're giving to society you're a kind nice person and then you are also the bitcoiner then they're not as ah this bitcoin thing and they're they're kind of lowering their ba uh, barriers and they're more open to the idea of it and that's why i'm like when someone asks me what's the best orange building uh strategy be really good in life be kind be the be the town hero uh the village hero uh, <laughs> like what, what, whatever you're doing try to give back to people uh live healthy work out uh lo look like you're a healthy happy human being and be a healthy happy human being uh, and i'm trying my best to be uh, that person i'm not always perfect but uh, I'm, I'm trying to do it uh, and i think people notice that like people realize that oh he's he's actually genuinely happy or not like if, if pe uh, people are happy they, they notice that and that's the best orange building because when then bitcoin comes up in their head and they are curious about it uh, they are taking your advice seriously if you are um uh, not good in your life you're like uh, in another good of place on, on in your life they're not as um open or welcoming your your um, um opinion even though the opinion is as as valid from as from any other pe person no i i hear what you're saying because i was basically debating with the same idea recently which is that you know the best way to like for, I'm a very private person, so it's difficult for me to like to create this show was a big like personal obstacle for me to like commit to being in the public eye. And mm -hmm. with that also comes like the 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 more I would like like the the more I share my lifestyle with the community, the more clear like I could 
be sharing those concepts but it's a huge struggle for me like how much do you reveal of yourself and how much do you keep private but at the same time like if you reveal because there's also that whole thing because in social media like there's so much like sharing and envy I don't like how like uh, to create FOMO in other people that causes me um, unrest but what you're talking about is so much more elegant because it's it's like the same ideas that I was debating, but it's not about the jealousy and the envy. It's about like you are you are like you have a high quality of life, which like reaffirms that Bitcoin is a good thing for yourself and for society because it allows you to have a happy, stable, like long term, pref long time preference, calm life. Yeah, definitely. So I like how you worded it because I was really struggling with this concept the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and, and, and and people love it when you share your life, by the way, like uh, this is uh, off topic, but as you mentioned it, like um, if, if, if you share stuff on your podcast and I, in the first episodes, I did not uh, share a lot about me, but I tried to share more, more about my story also. Uh, I mean, I always um, make the episodes about uh, my guests, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's uh, really cool to like uh, get in some some personal stories and get in. Like, I have people watch my episode every day, uh, and they are curious about the guests, of course, but they are um, really also curious about myself. So, uh, if if you share small stories of yourself, like I shared a lot that I'm a swimmer, I shared a lot about that. I shared a lot about my personal uh, in investment uh, story, how uh, I did also shit coins and then came back to Bitcoin only. Uh, I shared some of those stories. And this is the stuff that actually people remember. And I had people on that watch also a lot of my podcasts before. Uh, those people that are the first time on a podcast, uh, they wanted to prepare themselves and they like uh, watch their episodes. And when I went with them on the podcast, then, for example, as with Luke uh, or with, with other people, um, I had the feeling that I am already best friends with them <laughs> because they knew so much about me. And it <laughs> felt like it's, 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 it's um, sharing stuff online, um, like, for me, it's like you have to make either decision. Either you are completely off grid, your your face is not shown, you 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 don't show yourself, um, or you're online. Uh, once you're online, you you people will know you. People, if if someone wants to find out uh, who's Stani and is she related to Bitcoin, they are now able to do it because you put yourself out there. Uh, and then I always recommend like share what you're comfortable sharing uh, and the more you share uh, the the better or uh, relationship you can make with your um, yeah uh, viewers because it, it's like with, with in real life also like if, if you have friends uh, the best friends uh, know the most of you uh, because you share the most with, with you um, with them and uh, it's it's the same way in in, uh, in in social media the only important thing with that is you have to set like your like complete boundaries where like okay this is um, where I'm not talking about um, um, stuff like that for example I, I talk a lot about uh, my girlfriend also in, in the podcast show but I never share her name I never share other stuff about her uh, because I want to respect her privacy uh, and even though she's herself online she has more YouTube subscribers than me <laughs> But but uh, I, I don't uh, want to talk to her. I don't want to uh, make this connection. Uh, so I just talk my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to, to say her name. So like is, there is uh, things where you just have to be like, okay, these are the things that I want to keep private. This is what I not want to share. And the rest I'm open uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like, I mean, this is up to you how you do it, but this is uh, how, how I've done it. And I think uh, having ha having this, distance remote relationship with the viewers is really cool uh, and i get the comments section i love uh, because they're getting better and better because the relationship is getting better and better besides the few scam comments that i have to delete all every day i think there's some i don't even know the names uh, the same am something token going on 
uh, that I have to lead my, I'm uploading a video, first five minutes, I have 30 comments of, of that spot, uh, bot things. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite annoying, but I, I try to keep my comment sections clean. <laughs> Yeah, I used to work for Tony Vase and the spammers are always commenting. Eventually, we gave up on like uh, micromanaging all the scams because it was like every week it was a different coin and a different scammer. I did I did actually end up writing uh, code for a bot to help manage the comments. I have mm -hmm. it archived somewhere. So if one day you need it, I will <laughs> hook you up with it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, in the end, it would have it would be the job of Twitter, YouTube to deal with the stuff. Yeah, uh, I feel like on Twitter, even though I have the more followings and they get more comments there, uh, it's better. I, I feel like I don't get a lot of it. Maybe I'm not seeing it. I don't know. I have, I have a quality filter in in Twitter mm -hmm. activated, so maybe in, in Twitter it's better. But in YouTube, I, I activated that I see all the comments. Uh, so like yeah, it's it's weird, but yeah, definitely. I sh uh, I'm 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 really passionate about sharing my my stuff online. I'm also seeing like the podcast that I do now uh, is not a short term thing. Like I will do my podcast till till I die uh, because it's it's fascinating for me to having this uh, out out this uh, yeah this this broadcasting of my current. Uh, beliefs of my current uh, friends and, and, and circles that I have uh, and documented. I see it also, uh, this, this, I saw it in a random speech and this resonated a lot with me. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin, by the way, but this resonated a lot with me. Um, the, he said like uh, he's really passionate about content created creation because he thinks about his grand grandson that is now able to watch his his grand 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 grandpa uh, how he was in life what he did what he uh, uh, he did and and stuff like that and this is something where I'm like this is really cool how much money would I give to see my grand grand grandpa not only on a picture. Like yeah. how, how amazing it would be to have like two hours of podcast with him where he explained his worldviews. This would be something I would actually pay a lot of money to get. Uh, and uh, putting this out and, and showing if if a grand, 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 grandson is interested in it, he can look, look at it. That's uh, amazing. Well, I already have a daughter, so I can resonate very much with your idea. I have more questions about the actual 100 episodes, but I do want to talk about, like, since we're on the personal round, I wanted to talk about that a little bit more, like, where do you live? Do you go to your local conferences? Do you interact with the community in, like, real life? What, what, how do you feel about that stuff? I'm trying to be more uh, physical involved also in Bitcoin, <laughs> if, if I can say it like that. Um, I was last year in Prague. I will be this year in Prague. Prague is amazing because it's such a, huge conference so everybody is there everybody that is really involved in bitcoin will be there i'm also moving to vienna uh, I'm, I'm probably going to um, meetups also there uh, right now i'm close like one two hours away from vienna in a smaller city uh, which i have not been to any meetups there are meetups some uh, time but not a lot and every time it was i did not have time uh, so it was like a weird, weird thing. Uh, and I was, I'm only one year now here. And before I was in Munich, in Munich, I was also at some meetups, uh, which I love, honestly, I'm um, getting to know, uh, Bitcoiners, like actually in person, it's a different feeling. I always encourage everybody to go to conferences. If you never have been to a conference or a meetup, go to some, something like that, maybe start with a local meetup, but there is no matter where you live, uh, in like one, two hours, uh, reach, there's some Bitcoin meetup. If you look it up, like there's, there's like, uh, I don't know if there's any place on the world where there's no Bitcoin meetup, uh, in not two hours range or something like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you, you probably find it somehow. Uh, so I encourage everybody to, to go to Bitcoin meetups, to local meetups, uh, and meet people there. And then uh, if you're ready, go to a Bitcoin Prague conference. Uh, it can be uh, intimidating if there are like 8,000 people there, but 8,000 people is also good because nobody will notice you anyways. Like you can go 
in there and be basically a ghost because if nobody knows you, you 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 will be unnoticed because there are so many faces around. So you can really go to the booths, uh, check out the companies. Uh, you can meet uh, people. I got a, a picture with Marcus Saylor and Saifedine Moose on the same picture uh, with me, which looks hilarious because I'm two meters and uh, Marcus Saylor is small and Saifedine is even smaller than him, uh, which, which looks like kind of like that. Uh, <laughs> uh so I, I'm I'm loving this 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 uh picture. Uh so you we meet me Jimmy Song. Jimmy Song is super tall. He he doesn't look oh. it, but he's super tall. <laughs> I, I've never met Jimmy Song in, in, in real life. Uh, I think I don't know if he, he was not at Bitcoin Prague last year or I just missed him. Uh but I he's tall, you say? Yeah. So you'll get the opposite effect when you take a photo with it. Well, <laughs> it will be even. So, so yeah. the next big, I I do agree with the conferences. One thing that also happens is that you'll be in you you can be a ghost, but also you'll find other people who will be open to talking to you. And what you will quickly discover is that most Bitcoiners have gone on very similar journeys. Like you discover it, you go shitcoin for a little bit while you like find your st footing. And then when you start like maturing and realizing what this really is about, then you you stop participating in all the scams and all the money printing and you focus your energy back on Bitcoin. It just takes a moment to like to make that realization. That's why I think that they do the halving graduations, like what gen like what um uh, graduation you're from, because the, you have to kind of go through a halving to really become a maximalist unless you're extremely smart. You have to go through like this little journey. It's fascinating to see Mark Taylor uh, because he has been from the beginning Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Like once he got Bitcoin, he uh, never looked at any altcoins. He probably looked at altcoins, but privately and he researched about it. I'm 100% certain. Like it, it's it's fascinating for me how how amazingly he entered the, the space because most do some altcoining. You also see it with Gary Cardone right now. I interviewed him and he is definitely a Bitcoin maxi. Like when you talk with him, uh, his mindset, that's a Bitcoin maxi mindset that just did not discover the Bitcoin maxi thing. Uh, so he will be, I think, uh, right there where he is. But he did the interview with, with the Cardano guy, I think, or Solana, I think. Yeah. I don't know, one of the two things I I don't even know which which shit coin he was on. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I had a question under these lines, which was like, would you ever bring on the show to interview like your enemies in the sense of like keeping your enemies close or learning what they're thinking about, or would you like trying to strive away from diverging opinions? Um, I have a close friend in Munich that begs me always to bring some uh, shit coin on. And I, um, I'm always saying I am curious about stuff, but I don't want to promote um, scams. And for me, all the altcoins uh, are in some sense a scam. Uh, maybe they are not intended as a scam. Maybe they don't want to scam people. They just like really want to improve on something and they really think there's utility value and innovation in, in there. Uh, but in the end of the day, I think there is no real value. Um, I could be wrong, honestly. I'm 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 getting through my podcast. I actually am more open uh, and more free market maximalist <laughs> than than uh, saying more toxic stuff because I'm thinking like, okay, there is like someone pays millions of dollars for some picture. I don't get it. Like I don't get art. Like why someone is paying oh, so the sixteen Bitcoin for the buy Bitcoin sign. Hmm? Are you talking about yeah, the buy Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 16 Bitcoin? But this awesome. is, yeah, this is what I also don't get. But um, I'm a free market maximalist where I'm like, if someone pays a price for that, it's okay. Like, if, like I would not do it. I would not recommend it. Uh, but if someone does it, it's okay. Like the the if 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 nobody was forced to do it or nobody was lied to. Uh, this is where uh, most altcoins fail. When I see their website and they're like, oh, we are at this decentralized uh, ding, 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 ding. 
No, you're not. You're not decentralized. There's one person that can alter the, the protocol. There's one point, even with Ethereum, there's Vitalik that truly <laughs> owns and controls this whole thing. He can uh, get the thing from proof of work to proof of stake. He can reverse transactions. He, he clearly is in control of the protocol. <laughs> there's, there's no question about it. But they're like, oh, we are decentralizing apps. No, you're like... Uh, uh, not decentralized, you're decentral more decentralized than a centralized database, but there is a single point of failure. That's a company, <laughs> what you're running. And this is where I have most of my problems. But I also had people on um, the gold guy, it, not Peter Schiff, but uh, someone similar to him, but uh, someone that has actually Bitcoin, but he only has like five or 10% of, of, of Bitcoin and the rest is in gold. Uh, and and he was really also good about altcoins and shitcoins. Uh, he was like, it, they have some value. Uh, and uh, also he was like, gold is superior and stuff like that. He But he admitted in the end of the podcast that it's very likely that Bitcoin is outperforming gold. Uh, so he was probably the most anti-Bitcoin maxi guy I had on. Uh, um, but even though the, the episode was uh, great uh, performing and people liked it, I think I think it's it's not bad uh, if you bring on other guests. Um, but right now, like I like to speak with Bitcoiners <laughs> and that's why I have the Bitcoiners on. Yeah, That's... and I meant it more in the sense that like it's education through debate. I I didn't mean it so much as like uh, giving them a space to advertise their own product, but more as in like how much you learn from debating these technologies and actually explaining why they're not Bitcoin and why they're not that like the that the value that they're trying to propose or the arguments they're trying to make are not mm. there. But like, but then I realized that that would make more sense if you have two guests, one who is in favor of it, one who is against it, and they can debate the technology together. That, that like uh, hosting. Yeah, today. I would definitely, I would definitely do that. I don't know if if um, someone is willing to do that because I'm clearly on the Bitcoin camp, and I would have to be the moderator that's neutral. I, it would be really hard for me to. <laughs> to be that neutral host but i think i would be not not as bad in this uh, as as some might think uh but right now i'm just like really curious about bitcoiners uh yeah. and i i am booked till i think like middle of may like i'm always like at least two sometimes even four weeks in advance completely booked every day with with guests uh, so i i have n absolutely no problem in in getting guests on the podcast uh, and so I'm like, b before I ran out of Bitcoiners, maybe I think of like, oh, there, he is really interesting. Maybe, maybe let's get a debate or something like that. But there's so many great people out there that I want to interview before uh, I, I get into altcoins or stuff like that. Uh, and then there's already this thing where I'm like, okay, these episodes are getting uh, um, a few months old now, half a year old, maybe soon like a year old. I started in, in December. December is still far away, but at some point it's getting a one year old. Uh, what do I do? Do I release great episodes again? Because it was a great episode and I can release it again. Or do I invite him back uh, and have a second round with him? Uh, and then there are those questions um, where I'm like curious, like, I think I will not run out of, of cool Bitcoiners to interview. Uh, this is a thing that I actually feared when I started it. But there are so many great people in Bitcoin. And also there's always a new thing happening. So my my opinion, it would be to just invite them again, because there's always something new happening in Bitcoin and they'll have a new perspective about this uh, new BIP or this new uh, wallet who's doing things wrong or is doing things really right. You know, th there's always something new to talk about. So I'm sure you will have plenty of yeah, opportunities to come. But I actually but I actually had this this fear where I'm like, who will come on my podcast? Like like now hundred episodes later, it's 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 it seems irrational. But I had to like who who will who is willing to come on my podcast? Like, who is willing to talk with me? Turns out people uh, like to talk about themselves and people like to be interviewed. Uh, I 
rarely get someone uh, to say no to an invitation, even bigger ones. Like I actually nobody. Uh, there's uh, only I think three or four people that said no, uh, but they are not because they are big. They just said no uh, because they never went on an interview and they said like, ah, they want to stay private and stuff like that. And I even have pipped, uh, people on completely anonymous. Like their their voices, uh, their, 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 uh, okay. yeah, their, their, their. Well, no image and with the voice um, muffled. Or like no, no, no. Uh, I, I just uh, blend in like a black screen, uh, like they're not shown at all, uh, and it's just their voice. So like I'm the only one seen in the screen, and I just blend in their their profile photo usually, uh, and that's also like that's I'm like I'm open that like if someone do doesn't want to share his his face, it's 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 fine for me. Like this is no problem, and even it's funny. It has no impact on the average view duration. I thought like people want to see faces, but it does not like the people still watch it usually normally. <laughs> no, and then there's also some very important players in the big Bitcoin industry that will be willing to participate in the conversation, but want to remain anonymous because I, I've uh, been like when we were doing the Tony Bass podcast, that also happened that we would have guests. He would have guests that were anonymous. With the yeah. voice distortion as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, voice distortion actually did not had. Uh, I think I have. Can I do it? Wait. Now you hear me differently, right? <laughs> could, could you hear me differently now? In a little bit. Just a little bit, yes. Okay, then not, not really. Okay. But uh, now it's in back to normal. Right? Yeah, it was just a little subtle, like a little deeper. But it wasn't like... But who knows? Who knows if that is enough to like... Good yeah, I, I I played around with my new mixer because because of the new microphone I need a mixer and I was uh, like I played around a little bit with that, uh, but I was like yeah you could do it like that and just go in an interview with with that but it's more uh, for me it's more a gimmick uh, and uh, not not a voice distortion <laughs> my voice is pretty normal now. <laughs> So I have a, another question for you. I mean, I have another question about the 100 episodes, but before I get to it, I want to ask you, um, what's your favorite favorite Bitcoin book? Ooh. I mean, uh, the one that I actually still give out to Orange Peel people is the Bitcoin Standard. Uh -huh. uh, it's 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 really boring to say it. <laughs> Because it's so an, such an obvious choice, but it, there's a reason why it's so obvious. Um, it explains the the thing, the, how I see it, the best way. And I was orange built a lot by Saifedi Namus. I was orange built also by uh, Michael Saylor a lot uh, in in my early days, uh, four like right around four years ago. Um, probably that's why like this book helped me the most to get Bitcoin. When I uh, first got into Bitcoin, I was in the stock mindset. So I was like, an asset has to have a cash flow. Other, if it does not have a cash flow, I cannot value it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really needed Michael Seda and Saifedi Namus explaining me the value of money, what is money, uh, and it did, does not have to be uh, a cash flow. And Saifedin does this great because he can explain the history of money so great, especially in his book. Uh, and I'm, I'm now uh, trying to read also his his uh, second and third book. Uh, and I think he co-read even a fourth book or something like that about food, uh, which I'm curious about. Uh, but it does too many books to read, honestly. In the beginning <laughs> already, there's so many great things going on, and I love it. Uh, and uh, Michael Saylor was great because he is the longest-serving uh, publicly traded CEO, publicly the CEO of a public traded company. Uh, so he knows how to speak to an investor, and I was an investor in stocks. So his articulating things his way of speaking really resonated with me uh so i would love for him to write a book i would have uh, really 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 liked it but he did not write a book he uh, just uh, decided to go on on, on podcast which i respect the decision uh, but cypher the way he explained it in the bitcoin standard is still for me uh 
uh, the favorite wo- uh, favorite book. And I think it's really cool also that the foreword of the Bitcoin Standard is now with Michael Saylor uh, after the, how was his name? Tal- Talis, uh, the other one that was before the, the foreword uh, of, of, of the Bitcoin Standard. And now it's Michael Saylor, and I, I love that uh, they they two have like partnered up for for that book, and it's it's still my number one book for orange peeling people and giving it to people. I I meet an ex colleague in like three weeks, uh, and when I went uh, from from my work, I gifted her this book. So I'm really curious if she uh, ha, uh, has read it and I will interview her about it. Not interview on on, on, on the podcast, but I will uh, speak with her about it. So uh, this was the book that was also the most successful uh, in orange building people. Because when I go ahead and, and try to speak with people about Bitcoin in, in real life and orange building them, I'm really defensive. Like if they are interested in it, they can come to me and I will point them to the resources. And I'm if they then invest the time in being in a book, being in that and that and that, then I'm, I'm willing to debate them a little bit more and willing to speak with them more. Uh, I completely uh, stopped speaking with people that did not spend time learning about bitcoin it's i found it maybe it's a, <laughs> maybe it's controversial but i found it's a waste of time to speak with people that are uh, opinionated about bitcoin but have no but clue about it. yeah like if if they're neutral or don't know then there's still like a way of like having a dialogue but if someone is negative but also doesn't want to study it it's difficult to then find common ground definitely actually yeah, and, and- sorry go ahead and even people that uh, are neutral ab- about it or like even positive about it, I put them on like, you should study this, you should study this, you should study this. And then after that, uh, I will, will talk with them because I think you have to, Bitcoin is not something, you, you can spark an interest in someone in like a one, two hour conversation, uh, but you have to sit down and really understand it. It's something that's, for most people, most people think inflation is good. Most people think uh, um, that this 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 whole concept of Bitcoin and deflationary money uh, is 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 not as great. Inflation is good. We need inflation a little bit of it. Maybe we have now too much inflation, but a little bit inflation is good. Uh, most people still think that because it's uh, teached in the schools. Uh, then blockchain, nobody knows what actually blockchain is. And then uh, I also try never do introduce too many words they don't understand like if you talk with someone uh, and you mention one two words they don't understand they're gone so that's why i'm like not even mentioning blockchain uh, or any like blockchain is like a really uh like when you say blockchain to a bitcoiner they think that you are in crypto world uh, and when you m- mention bit blockchain to a newbie he does not know what you're speaking about. So like blockchain, you can basically completely delete from your, from your <laughs> uh, way of, of speaking. Uh, and yeah, it's like, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to make it really easy. Like go out in the world, uh, go in some uh, places where a lot of people pass by and ask them what the halving is. Like if you interview hundred people, maybe one guy knows it because he got in. Uh, he got uh, he he saw it in the news and he read something about it. Like not a lot of people know what 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 the things that we are taking for granted are. Uh, so we have to be the educators. We have to make education really really good and accessible for everybody. And this means not talking too much technical. There there if if you have a technical podcast, this is fine. Uh, but this is a podcast probably for Bitcoiners that are in India and they want to dive deeper for programmers and stuff like that. But if you are wanting to have the newer guys, the newer people uh, in the in the Bitcoin sphere, you cannot talk uh, in those technical terms. You should also like delete some some trigger words from your language. And I always try to do that in my podcast, and it, it gets really hard. Uh, like if if there's something in the podcast that is uh, hard to understand or like a word that is not commonly used uh, i always ask the guests okay can you expand like please uh, summarize quickly what what you're talking about 
Uh, I had someone on, uh, he, he was talking about uh, why Lightning, the Lightning Network will revolutionize the workforce. And, and he had some articles in the, in the Bitcoin magazine even uh, about that. And the first thing I did in the podcast, I asked him, okay, can you please in simple terms uh, explain what is the Lightning Network? How does it work? Uh, and uh, and yeah, he 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 had a great he had a great explanation for that. But I think yeah. this is always uh, important to lay the groundwork because there's some guy that is completely new to Bitcoin that watches now the second video of of of, of Bitcoin, and then there's someone talking about the Lightning Network, and he's confused. He's like. What is it like? Is this something else than Bitcoin? Does it belong to Bitcoin? Is it integrative? Like pe people don't know that, and so you have to be really back to the basics. Uh, and this is the, the 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 most important stuff. You have to stick to the basics. You have to uh, speak in a simple language people can understand. Uh, otherwise, they will like, just turn off. Like they are, they're sitting in front of their laptop. Uh, and there are like 50 other things they can do right now. And there is Netflix popping up. They can relax now. They can go to bed. They can uh, play a video game. But they're choosing to watch this video about Bitcoin. They're giving us their time uh, and getting educated on stuff. So we should not like uh, be in, in have, make inside jokes or like being uh, something excluded. Like if, if you make an inside joke and someone new comes in, he does not get it. And if you're not inside, you're outside and then he clicks away and he's he's gone. Uh, so that's really uh, important for, I think, for, for Bitcoiners, for educators, for podcast hosts. Um, if you're not specific, technical and specific for pro Bitcoiners that are already in there and want to dive deep in some technical terms, then I understand it. But if you are someone that has like, Jeff Booths and the Michael Saylors on and then has people on that more uh, aimed to the new people, keep it really, really simple. Like <laughs> there's no need to scare someone away with weird uh, financial terms. This is what uh, the the financial planners in the bank always do. Like they, they tell you so many financial terms that you're like, Ooh, and then you're like, okay, here my money and deal with it. But we are not that. <laughs> like we, we want to uh, have them take care of their own financial uh, future and that's why we have to educate them and this is uh, something that i'm really passionate about that uh education uh of 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 new people uh like the newer folks in bitcoin and yeah I'm, I'm, i think it's really important to speak in a simple language yeah actually that like goes into one of my questions that i wanted to ask you earlier but I, we got carried away like why Bitcoin? What was your Bitcoin journey? How did you like this? You kind of told me like what your journey was, but how did you discover it? And how did you like, how did it capture you? And why uh, is it important? Yeah, that's a really cool story. Um, I was, before I talked about like, let, let's start from the beginning. Um, when I was 18 years old, or maybe let's start even earlier, I was always an extremely saving person. Like even when my mom gave me like three euros uh, to, to school so I can get some bread in the school, I always took away at least one euro. So I was like, even when I was really small and really little, I got the point where I'm like, if I save that money, I can buy my own stuff from that. Like I'm not depending on my mom then. So like I, I got the in, in initially the, this thing, like if I save financial energy, this buys me freedom that what that I can do whatever I want with that money. Obviously, you don't get rich if you save one euro a day from mom's pocket money when you are like 10 years old. Uh, but uh, this was really like early on. And there's even this this one thing in in that I this is uh, funny. I never shared the story, but I think it, it stuck in my head. And I was like in school. I don't know how old I was, like really little, maybe 11 or 12 years old or something like that and i was extremely saving like and when the other people and it's i'm not like from a, a poor family like i was from a middle class normal family uh my dad struggled a lot because he built a company uh but then when he built a company he did really good because he sold the company and stuff like that uh so we 
yeah, struggled financially till I was like five years old, but then it was like middle class and it was really good. Um, but so I, I, I did not have to save crazy. Like I, I did not have to like save every cent and watch everything because everything has been given to me. Um, but the funny thing is that I was the saving personality uh, and it's probably because of my dad, uh, because he also like, is like that. And when my, uh, it was like in one lunchtime in school, it was like 11, um, AM and it was lunchtime. I was in the, in the spa in a local supermarket. Uh, and my mom was by accident also there. And she saw that I only like got a ro really small bread because I know when I come home, I have the whole fridge for myself and I don't have to buy anything. So why eat now a lot when I can eat uh, later for free? Uh, and I had this small bread uh, and my mom was like, here, five years, buy something more. <laughs> 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 he, he, she 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 uh she can, could not see it and uh like it, this is uh some some stories that like stuck with me and having this savings mind which is then uh, also important for the later story when you when you then get to 18 years old you all of a sudden i even next to school i worked because i got it that i have to work and and, and start earning my money uh, so I earned my money and I had an, an IT job, uh, like a software developer, because I was in a software developing school. So I had like some small projects, even with 18 years old, uh, going on. And uh, I saved just money. And with 18 years old, then you can invest because before 18 years old, uh, you're not allowed to invest without your mom and dad, uh, as, at, at least in Austria. I don't know how it uh, is around the world, which is funny for me you can vote with 16 years old you can drive a car with 17 years old but investing your in your future you're not allowed till till 18 years old but uh, it's okay uh, so i opened my my uh, account i got into uh, etfs fonds stuff like that nothing uh, special i think i made uh, like a few euros in a year and yeah lost it all because i had to pay fees and stuff like that so i saw first year of investing and it was like leveling out uh and uh i had this moment uh where where i invested then uh, in individual stocks also and uh, the funny thing is like i had no clue about stock picking i had no clue about what it is but i knew i want to do more with my money like the savings account I had, I had the ETFs, but it was not, it was not enough. Like it was like, I put it there because then my money was not in the bank account. So I, I don't know why I knew uh, initially that it's not doing good. If it's just sitting in the bank account, I'm really grateful that I just had this feeling always that if it's just in the bank account, it's not doing anything. I did not understand money. Uh, like, but I just, in it, like from my heart, I knew if it's just sitting there, not doing anything, uh, which is fascinating for me that I understood that without any knowledge about it. Like there was no guy in my family explained it to me. Like it was, was just something that came to my mind. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, savings account, ETFs and stuff like that. Uh, and then I was like, yeah, let's pick individual stocks. I had no clue about it, but let's, let's get into it. And the moment where I was deciding, let's go into individual stocks, I was sitting at McDonald's. Uh, as uh, yeah, as a 19 year old uh, uh, boy, and I was like, yeah, let's let's buy McDonald's stocks. So I bought McDonald's stocks, and funny enough, from that McDonald's stock, I got a lot of motivation because all of a sudden they were like, I don't know, 500 euros, 600 euros, or something like that in the stock. And because of that, I learned a lot about stock investing, PE ratios, stuff like that, management. Even got some courses online, dove really deep. The good thing I was bored at school, so I had my headphones on and learned uh, while I learned about uh, investing while I was sitting on school. Uh, I may I make this story maybe a little too long, and hopefully it's not bad for you. Uh, no, and it, it's uh, you know uh, around Bitcoiners, or I mean, when I started uh, into Bitcoin, I learned that in children, one of the signs that they're gonna be successful in life is if they understand delayed reward. So like mm -hmm. if you do an exercise, like I can give you one cookie now or two cookies when you get back from school, which do you pick? And the children who pick two cookies when you get back from school tend to have a, a, a higher chance to succeed in life. So so those are very, like the traits that you're talking about go very, are very aligned with the Bitcoin culture.
Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah. Um, moving on with the story, as like uh, I then started to learn a lot about individual stock picking, and I was quite successful with it. Uh, I made uh, my you actually quite huge gains uh, with it. Uh, I, I lost also a lot of money. <laughs> was a really interesting ride for like three years or something like that and because i was extremely successful and i was outspoken about it i even had a youtube channel with stock investing i talked about uh, tesla stock because this was my most successful stock uh, that i had also i had apple facebook i had all the tech stock because i was a software developer uh, and because i was so outspoken about uh my investing strategies and how much I even shared exactly how much money I made. I now deleted all those uh, <laughs> videos because it was, uh, then you can figure out how much Bitcoin I have now. And I, I'm, I'm trying to hide this a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, I guess you can kind of find it out online if you, if you really dig deep. I don't know if it's possible still, uh, but maybe it's somehow possible. Uh, and uh, uh, even small amount of Bitcoin will be coveted. So um, once you're in the public eye, what really matters is that you you follow your own advice in the sense that we <laughs> we follow our own advice in terms of security, safety, privacy, <laughs> and just yeah. be meticulous with your cold storage and all that stuff. Because even yeah, I don't know if you knew about that hack where one of the Bitcoin developers, he's even like a Bitcoin core developer, and he got robbed. Because mm -hmm. someone, I mean, recently they sent this disclosure that the FBI had collected the names of all the people who had bought tickets to some developer conference. So it's uh, it seems like someone from there was the person who robbed him. So you, you just have to be very careful. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think uh, in self custody, um, there are those points where you have to hit. Like if you have over a thousand uh euros or dollars in bitcoin you have to have self-custody there's no way around it under 1000 uh there's might be a like okay let's let's accumulate them on exchange and then move them over to self-custody once it hits that but even then you can have like an, 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 a mobile wallet or something like that but there can be this argument made that uh, uh Bitcoin on exchange might be even safer than some some mobile wallet when it's like broken and then you can uh, not not find it anymore. But uh, but even above thousand euros, there's no discussion about self custody. You have to have self custody, uh, and I'm thrilling my friends about it uh, because uh, I have a lot of friends that are in Bitcoin and they have a lot more money than a thousand euros in in Bitcoin and they keep it on exchange. Oh. And they even had it on in Celsius and they lost money, but now they got it back. And then eh, it's not that bad uh, because they actually got like, I don't know, 70, 80% or something like that from Celsius back. So now they're like playing it down again. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you will lose it again. <laughs> Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistic. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. I really liked a lot of the things you were saying because for the Spanish podcast like I'm Colombian originally and so I want to do a version of the podcast in Spanish but I had been like struggling to like how to get started and mm -hmm. I think that a lot of what you said helped me in the sense that it might be easier to start the Colombian podcast with the stuff that to me is kind of trivial, but I think it's, it's not actually trivial. It's just trivial to me because I've heard it so many times. I've had it so internalized that I don't like give it the worth and the value that it has. 
which is to start with the philosophy and the culture and more like what is money and why do we like but in this but relating it back to events in South America or Latin events because it's very difficult for Latin people they don't relate to like um um uh, like um you know how the money goes to the bankers and we uh how do you call it when you um bail out the bailouts like the like a lot of latin people don't have a strong relationship to this idea of bailing out the banks or what because that's not not happening so much in some of the latin countries as it happens in the developed countries so we have to like relate it back to economical factors that are happening locally in those communities, but without using big words. Oh, mm -hmm. my dog. That reminds me. I think the book, I think um, when when Safetyan's book was coming out, um, that was right when I was getting into Bitcoin. And I think that I got that book for free because I took a photo with my dog and the Mastering Bitcoin book. And it was like a little competition. So Safe DM sent me, uh, what is, uh, no, um, uh, the, the Bitcoin standard. He sent me the Bitcoin standard because I had won this little photo competition when I first got into Bitcoin. So I read this book a long time ago. And a lot of the things that you talk about the book were the things that resonated with me a lot. Like he he has a very good ability to explaining what is money very clearly and like why why that whole structure is falling apart. Why and and he makes it less like we're so attached to to the coins that we use today because it's become normal. So just the idea that like you would be switching from shells to gold is like no why we have shells like why would we use gold you're crazy so like uh it allows you to understand like the evolution and kind of become less attached to to and, and being more capable of letting go of this idea that we need fiat and become more comfortable with the idea that this can evolve and become that like our money can become a new thing it doesn't have to be the same thing we've been using because this isn't how what we have used forever so I, I do think that that's a great choice, even though it's an obvious one. Yeah, and it's it's so important that we hammer home this uh, basics. Uh, and I just discovered that I was, <laughs> I did I did I did wander off in my story. I was I did not even come to my Bitcoin part of the story uh, how I discovered Bitcoin. Oh, I just... oh, yeah. Then what happened? Tell us. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry I'm, I'm I'm all over the place usually when I speak. Uh, that's why when when I have like uh, my my interviews lined up uh, and I have the guest on, I I have to have like a document on where I'm like, okay, I, I wanted to talk about this and I have this question uh, still and stuff like that. Then I'm organized and I can dig deep. But uh, if I'm like interviewed, I'm have not no notes or something like that. I'm just like going, <laughs> there as I'm going, uh, which is uh, more chaotic. But I was a successful investing uh, and people kept asking me about Bitcoin and I was for three years saying it's a scam. And that's why I'm saying we have to get those basics right. Uh, I was saying from 2017 to two, uh, 2020 that Bitcoin is a scam. Uh, and then uh, a friend, a colleague of mine actually uh, asked me, oh, what do you think of Bitcoin? And he was not even in Bitcoin. Like <laughs> he was just asking me about it. Uh, but he was asking so great that I discovered that I don't have good enough arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, I went on this journey on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, like on a weekend journey. And I'm like, oh, I don't have a lot of uh, plans. And I had this, um, uh, I, I did not have as much to do as I have now. So I had the time to like really block out just three days and dive really deep into one topic. Mm -hmm. uh, like Friday coming home, uh, from I think it was work uh, back then uh, uh, yeah for civil service I had then uh, it was work so on Friday midday I came home got to my computer and was diving deep into Bitcoin till Sunday to prove to my friend that was not even in Bitcoin why Bitcoin <laughs> that, 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 that Bitcoin that, is a scam <laughs> yes I, I want to prove I want to find the arguments why Bitcoin is a scam mm -hmm. and I'm always really open to everything. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not someone that wants to find his arguments. I, I want, really want to dive deep. And I discovered the Bitcoin community back then. Uh, in this, in this weekend, I discovered interviews, podcasts, and I was like, oh shit, this could be something. That that uh -huh. this could, this could be not a scam. 
Uh, so on Monday, I opened my Coinbase account. On Tuesday, I bought uh, my Ledger. Uh, this was, yeah, um, I, I obviously don't have my Coinbase account anymore. I obviously don't have a Ledger anymore. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I still have, uh, I, I had this. Uh, and then I, like, and this is also something, I don't know why, but I did not even get Bitcoin, but I got self-custody on the second day and i still kind of thought that bitcoin is a scam but i already got self custody like i never had custody bitcoin <laughs> like from the first euro that i invested in bitcoin i always had self custody uh i don't know why actually i just like i watched a video and he's like oh i get self custody uh, and i was like okay let's get self custody then mm-hmm. uh, i didn't understand what it is i i think i i thought it's the only way to hold bitcoin i thought you cannot even hold it somewhere else uh, because the exchange that I used to buy my stocks did not offer Bitcoin back then. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, I have to go to uh, uh, and like how to buy Bitcoin. And then there was like some video, I don't even remember who made it, but he's like, oh, get a Coinbase account then put it on your ledger. And then I was like, okay, let's get a Coinbase account, buy a ledger, put it on there. So like, and there was never the, the question if I leave it on Coinbase. And yeah, this was basically uh, my Bitcoin story. It was 2020. Uh, and from there onwards, I just learned every weekend a little bit more. And funny enough, from 2020 to one year later, I went from having all those stocks, all those properties uh, and getting completely only in Bitcoin one year later. Like 2021 was the point where I was only in Bitcoin because I got educated on, on it. And I was like, uh, at some point, I was 50-50, 50% Tesla, 50% Bitcoin. Then I was like, one day, it does not make sense that I hold Tesla. Tesla can be crashing tomorrow because Elon Musk makes some something stupid. Some I still tweet. <laughs> yeah, some tweet or something. Uh, I think the company is great, uh, but holding so much money in just one company is a big risk because with every company, they can... Uh, all the time something happening so i was just like ah, i don't want to have this centralized risk uh, and i don't know when some somewhere around 2021 i decided to ditch all my tesla stocks and and got slowly slowly more and more in, in bitcoin and uh, i had five percent ten percent twenty percent in bitcoin and then yeah one year later around that time after i got my, my first bitcoin uh then i got all in in bitcoin i only have bitcoin now i like i i own my microphone laptop camera uh, computer and and my bitcoin that's it nothing else like i i live rented i live i don't own anything else not even a car or something like that i i i i I try to own nothing except bitcoin and things where it does not make sense to rent it i i saw like some phone renting and a laptop renting but this does not make sense for me financially so i the things that are small like under a thousand euros like microphone phone keyboard and stuff like that that i buy uh, but other than that and clothes of course and stuff like that, but other than that i just have bitcoin yeah, I actually watched an episode of somebody who has been in Bitcoin for a long time now, and he was talking about how he didn't own real estate anymore or anything, because that way he was uh, free, move, who could move and move around. The only part that I found difficult about that concept or that approach is my trust for the food sources. The thing is that, like in Europe, you don't, you're not at such risk. But living in the United States, like I don't trust the steak I can buy at the store. I don't trust the eggs. I don't trust the milk. It's it, you. You have to be very careful how you source your food if you don't own anything. <laughs> I have chickens at home. Oh yeah, I mean this is like I also have a small dog, <laughs> but but I don't. I uh when when I say I don't have assets, I I don't consider my my dog an asset. <laughs> well, but, but yeah you have to yeah. kind of have land to be able to have chickens and oh yes yes, stuff yes like yeah. that <laughs> definitely and uh, i like the approach that jack Mullers said like i think jack Mullers, uh, uh and i want to get to this level i mean i even tweet about it uh he said like i own my company my house and uh my bitcoin and i think this is a good approach like if you have a company uh, obviously it's, it's good to own it uh and then uh, the next thing is a house i would if if you have 
uh, not enough money. Uh, so like if, if you're in a situation where when you buy a house, it would be all your financial energy that you need to buy this house, I would definitely not recommend buying a house because then you, all your financial energy is tied into that. Then you have to pay back a credit maybe over 40, 20 years. This is like really um, hard to overcome and it binds into one place. But if you really want to like it's emotional an, an emotional decision, you can still do it. Uh, I I personally don't choose to do that because I don't. I want to be a little bit more free. Uh, if you're in a situation where like when you buy a house, it would only be like a few percent of your uh, net worth, then like go ahead and don't have a problem with that. Uh, but I would uh, not pay to put all my financial energy in a house and then don't have any Bitcoin or stuff like that because uh, I think. Uh, Real estate could uh, become let let's let's frame it more positively. Real estate will become way more affordable in the future. I think. Well, and the thing is that the trick is that you buy the house, then you're in debt, then you have to have a job, so you become a slave to the fiat system because you need that income in order to pay for the house. So yeah. I mean, the the objective of this Bitcoin community is to try to help you strive away from those like money money uh time stealing strategies yeah and it this is uh something that i'm actually uh i mentioned my my the, i mean I, i'm keep mentioning my book but it's not even like not even written <laughs> so uh let, let's see how it, it it was but this is kind of a, also the idea uh where i want to go because uh i learned a lot by interviewing people and by uh like just being on my own and being way more free because bitcoin in the end of the day is just money but money can teach you something uh, and uh, i'm now in the position where i'm totally uh, free of time and location like i can choose whenever i want to uh, work and i can choose wherever i want to work because it's all like online uh, the thing that I did not uh, succeed at with completely uh, is, is uh, financial freedom uh, for me financial freedom is when you have so much financial energy that you can stop doing any work tomorrow and you will be fine for the rest of your life. This is when you uh, have complete financial freedom in, in my in, in my definition. Uh, other people have other definitions of, of that. Uh, so I try to value my time, my financial energy actually in time. I, I like when when someone asks me, "Oh, do you value your net worth in 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 Bitcoin or in euros?" I'm like, I value my net worth in time. Like when I stop doing everything tomorrow, how many years can I possibly live of my Bitcoin stack? That that's that's how I like I value my net worth in 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 kind of a time. Of obviously, I'm not paying with like oh I I bought bought McDonald's for five minutes of my life now, <laughs> or something like that. Well, it's just that's why some people uh, say that there is never enough money because uh, um, uh, the definition of what it means to be like so so I can get by for the rest of my life it changes from person to person. Like one person is gonna want to have a yacht to travel around the ocean, so they need a lot to get by for the rest of their life. <laughs> But if you, I mean, when we, if we're talking just the basics, you know, have a decent home, have a uh, like good access to good quality food, th those things are not so expensive. And if you live humble and you appreciate those little things in life, then then that number goes down quite drastically and it becomes more feasible and accomplishable. And I think uh, when you get to this point where you're completely free, like you lowered your life standard and this sounds always bad lowering your life standard but i think it's something good lowering your life standard to something that you like a minimalistic life where you can live off comfortable for a long period of time then you have all this free time and if you are a decent human being uh, which i think 99% uh, of the people are uh, then you will do something with that time maybe not on the first week but at one month you will get bored I'm 100% sure like there are so many stories about uh, young millionaires that try to retire at 23 uh, then they retired uh, till 24 and then they started companies at 25 again because yeah doing nothing is boring <laughs> yeah doing uh, nothing is difficult you you have to like like 
okay, you achieve that, and then what? You just spend it on a beach, or are you going to travel, or you go to Bitcoin conferences? Like, what do you do with that time, you know? And then there's this interesting point when you're completely free. Uh, you don't have to spend any time where you don't want to spend it. You can spend on the whole topics that you really are passionate about. And then all of a sudden you're thinking of ways how you can contribute to that community. Then you're free of like, I don't have to have money from that. You can just contribute freely to it. And I think then there's the point because you are contributing and because you are doing so many great things uh, in this community that you're actually getting the money that you actually can buy maybe a yacht someday or something like that. Because you're free, you're, you're thinking uh, in another way. And this is what I basically discovered. I was really worried about finances. I was like, uh, because I'm, I'm always like, I want to have more income than uh, <laughs> like expenses every month. Uh, and I was like, if I drop my normal job, can I hold myself over water with having more income than expenses? Uh, answer short is yes, uh, I can. And I'm even like close to the level than I was before, even though uh, I just started out with, with that. Uh, but the amazing thing is that I don't worry about money. Like I was so worried before I took the step to become uh, self-employed about money. And it was completely senseless. I, I'm not worried about money at all in my day. I just stand up at like five, six in the morning and I work the whole day. To the, right now it's like 10, uh, 10 30 at, at my at time. So I'm like up, like I don't even want to calculate how many hours I'm already working. Uh, but it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like a, a burden to me. Uh, and uh, it, it's it's something so amazing if you can just stand up and and do what you like do your love I'm, I'm i'm feeling so grateful that i can uh, talk about the thing that i'm most passionate about in my life right now every day and this every day with a different human being uh that is uh amazing and does great things in his life and and i can learn from them and this is back to your original first question what who, who did i learn the most from it I learn from every guest that comes on something new. And this is fascinating, you see, because you're, if you're actually uh, researching about the guest and you're actually listening to the guest, because if you're host, you kind of have to listen to the guest and you have to think of new questions and stuff like that. And then post-production, you have to edit it. You you listen to it twice, like you listen to it three times before you publish and maybe a fourth time. Uh, you really learn a lot. Like I uh, still am uh, um, having every day uh, audio books and I'm, I'm trying to learn more. But even if I did not learn anything, just my guests are a great source because we are talking about social media. We are talking about branding. We are talking about businesses. We are talking about Bitcoin. We are talking about life. We are talking about food. We are talking about so many different things. Even just for my guests. I think I would benefit so much from all those conversations. And then I'm also getting uh, invited to other podcasts. Uh, this week I have uh, this one and another one. Next week I have another uh, invitation to podcasts. Uh, so this, it's it's just great to being able to live off something that you really love. And I can just encourage everybody uh, to do exactly that. I'm not as aggressive as uh, Gary Cadone says it. If you are just working for money, you're a whore. But, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, I, I truly think that uh, if you are not happy with the things you're doing, you, you should at least try to, to find something you love and find a way how you can uh, um, uh, also get financially rewarded from that. I think we have very similar journeys, like not not in everything, but we have had moments where we've had very similar journeys because right now I like chosen to start this podcast and um, the way it works for me is that if I'm having fun doing it like this can this can last for a very long time because I, I enjoy the actual doing, which is. Mm -hmm which is kind of like what you were saying, like when I'm here and I'm shooting and I'm putting together the gadgets and I'm putting together the technical episodes, like I knew a lot about Bitcoin before starting the podcast, but I, but I understood it like in a generic way. But the podcast forces me to go from the generic to the specific and because I need to communicate these ideas and be very secure of like the technical concepts I'm communicating. So it's like forced me to go from like generic understandings to, to, to completely specific, like down to the code uh, 
understandings and it's been really really fun I, I really connect with you on on the fact that you have to enjoy what you're doing and when you do enjoy it and the irony is that when you do enjoy it and you find something that you're passionate about you're very likely to make a lot of money from it yeah do, do you have uh two different podcasts where you have like technical things and where you just like have this conversation like this It's more like a series. Uh, so we have a technical series. We have a gadget series. So the technical, I'm just like talking about the actual technology. In the gadgets, it goes like complementing the technical series. So if I've been talking about keys, then I talked about uh, like uh, key, sto key storage systems. Now I'm going to do the what is a wallet episode where I'm going to talk just technical. Then I'm going to do the keystone. I'm going to do the J. Then I'm going to talk about what is a node. Then I'm going to do like running a node. So so I'm doing the technical like hand by hand with the gadgets. And then on the other side, we're doing like news and noteworthy and cultural, which mm -hmm. is like I do. Uh, I covered like the Copa case or like these interviews are more like the cultural section because bitcoin has so many facets i couldn't really like narrow it down to like one thing so i just had one podcast with multiple series and 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 the fifth one is going to be in spanish but in spanish it's weird because you kind of have to do all four right we're still going to have technical talks we're still going to have philosophical talks so we'll see we'll see how it plays out. I'm not totally sure. But going back to your show, I do have uh, a couple questions before we finish, which is uh what have been your top 10 or top five favorite interviews? That's one one. And the other one is what is your wish list or like a couple names on your wish list that you still haven't gotten to grasp? Um, I think I started with the wish list. Uh, I made it publicly that I want, I have this goal to have 300 uh, interviews this year, at least. Uh, I might go over 300 uh, because I'm doing it daily now. Uh, I think if I'm continuing daily and I'm exceeding, like I I'm, will end up at like 310, 320 or something like that. Okay. Uh, I'm really passionate about doing over 300. Uh, and I would love the 200th guest to be Saifedi Namus and the 300th guest Michael Saylor. Uh, but I did not even reach out to them. So, uh, like they, they could not even, they did not even have the chance to say yes to me. Uh, but I will do it, uh, soon with Saifedi Namus, uh, and then uh, a little later with, with, with Michael Saylor. And I would love to have them on the podcast, uh, just because like Michael Saylor and, and Saifedi Namus are the, One one of the most influential guys in the early days on my Bitcoin thinking, and I got it. Uh, right now, I'm not listening to them because I consume them so much <laughs> that uh, I kind of, when I listen to Michael Saylor interview, it kind of gets boring nowadays for me. Uh, that's why I like to listen to new guys. That's why I also in the, invite a lot of new guys in. Uh, my top five, that's like really hard. Uh, of, of the current uh, interviews. I love the interview of Gary Cardone, uh, not because of the Bitcoin aspect, because he's just a 66-year-old guy who has a lot of life experience and you 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 get the often authenticity and this I don't care about anything uh, kind of a vibe, uh, which is uh, really, really uh, interesting to see. And it was like a fun experience. Uh, uh, to to have, then uh, the, the the second I would put a lot of guys uh, and and unfortunately I don't have too many girls on. I would love to have you on my my podcast because if if I, if I scroll through my my guest list, it's like girl girl. It's like I try to I try to have as many uh, women also on uh, as as possible. But uh, coming back to the question. Uh, Two, I would get um, like the 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 people like Luke, uh, the people uh, from I forgot his name. This he, he was my third guest, and he said Bitcoin is a system based on love. I never heard that before, uh, and love? I really love. Yes, love. Okay. Uh, and I loved it, and how and how he explained it also, and he was never on a other podcast than mine. Uh, and I loved his explanation. I loved how he he's talking about like on on the second place. I would put like two, three of of them who just like really had an an amazing view, and I didn't knew it before. Like mm -hmm. because they don't, don't put out a lot of tweets. 
uh, they don't have any YouTube channels. They were never on a podcast. So like, what do you know about this? The, the persons like nothing. And I was just going on to those podcasts with not a lot of questions because how do you uh, prepare for a podcast where there's nothing online? And I just like open like, hi, how are you doing? Uh, let's go through your Bitcoin story. And then it goes in the directions that, that you see. Uh, and those are the, the stories and those are the podcasts that I actually like like the most, uh, honestly, because they are completely, um, they are so new and they're so like, they have some sometimes opinions that I'm like, really have to think about them. If, if Jeff Booth is saying something, I don't really have to think about it because I heard it 20 times before. Uh, even even with Gary Cadone, it was nothing new. I, I listened to a lot of podcasts of his before, what he does and what he thinks. Uh, it was a little more interesting because he's really early now in the Bitcoin community and he, he he's not fully there uh, as 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 uh, Jeff Booth is and as, as Marcus Ailey and all, all the other bigger ones. And Natalie Brunel. Natalie Brunel, I also want to highlight because... Uh, she has a different kind of energy. I love it. I love how she's talking, uh, but she's a lot on like Fox News and all those channels. And I think she's really used to having like only like five minutes time or like two minutes time uh, to talk about something. And it, it was overwhelming for me, her amazing energy where she's like straightforward, really good in speaking, really good in speaking in a high energy way. The way I'm like, <laughs> it was overwhelming for me. Uh, I felt a little bit uh, the the overwhelming. It. Uh, I loved the interview. Uh, I I watched it already twice, even though uh, twice after it came out uh, because uh, it was amazing. Uh, before I watched it like three, four times for editing and stuff like that. Uh, so Jeff Booth, uh, I already mentioned. Uh, this was a, a big one for me because it personally impacted me, even though. Content-wise, I did not learn a lot of new stuff, uh, but uh, personally, it was really, really, really cool for me. Uh, let's see if I can find another example that was amazing. I mean, okay, I have to mention like the first one that I ever did. Uh, the story of the first podcast is always amazing because you don't like, I think... Mr. Beast says it, uh, the first hundred videos you're doing, you don't have any clue what you're doing. Uh, and I, I, I feel like that is really true because with every like 20 episodes I'm doing, I'm feeling so dumb what I did like 20 episodes ago. Uh, and and uh, I'm, I'm slowly getting to the point where I'm like, okay, I know a little bit. Like I know 2% what it takes to be a good host of a, a podcast maybe two percent i know when we have like 100 percent, we have like a joe rogan a lex friedman uh, uh from outside of bitcoin inside of bitcoin and peter mccormie that has uh, has done a lot of uh, interviews uh preston bish is i think also really good natalie brunel is also really good like when those are like between 80 and 100 percent, i think i'm like at two percent of, of of skill level and i have to learn a lot more and that's why i'm also doing it like all my life and when we talk about like 300 episodes a year of about in the next like 80 years a lot of episodes a, a lot of i'm really looking forward to my episodes when i'm like 90 years old <laughs> but it <laughs> and, was good that you like picked a very precise like focus to do it with interviews because then like um it, it keeps it very like uh channeled you have a very like focus mindset and so you can like barrel towards that goal very coherently for me it's harder because like for example technical episodes don't perform very well because um they're for like a very educational sweetheart thank you they're for educational purposes so it like um it takes time for people to catch on or it's just a resource for people. The ones that perform the best are when you're talking about what's happening at this moment with the controversies of like what's happening at the moment. So like any interview with anybody who's involved in any situation that is unfolding as you're going is going to be a huge success. And 100%. I love uh, doing the podcast and, uh, doing like every day the podcast, uh, having new people on, it's it's something I, I'm really grateful to have. Uh, and I'm wondering why I did not start it earlier now. 
uh but yeah i needed time like i i went into bitcoin i think um I, when we go into how i grew like how i came into bitcoin com in the bitcoin community uh, like in uh, 2023 i started my twitter account uh where i'm like really every day I'm, i will I publish something i had back then i think 300 followers or maybe 400 or something like that now when it 11000 something uh, one year later and and now i'm like since december i'm also starting the podcast i had like 200 followers uh, on on youtube in january now i have like over 3000 and it's it's uh, just overwhelming for me that uh, people are actually deciding to listening to me it's 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 still uh, like I, I, I cannot i can i i, I just don't get the point <laughs> Like people decide and also i don't know if you look to the youtube statistics a lot but you get the metric how many hours mm -hmm. in, in total uh people inside of your video uh and uh when i released the, the last episode with gary cadone it was in like the first four hours 800 hours were spent in my videos in the first four hours <laughs> like a lot, a lot of hours spent in the, in the videos and i think the best episodes with jeff booth with uh peter dunworth uh, with gary cadon with other people they're like thousands of hours in this video alone uh and uh, even uh bad episodes get like 500 400 700 uh total watch time hours and i'm like i'm feeling so humbled that people give me that time and that's why i'm really passionate about making the video as good as i possibly can with the trailer with the edits uh, i try to if, if there's something weird in the voice of the guest i'm trying with adobe enhanced speech with with getting the speech a little bit better and enhancing the audio uh, because if people are willing to invest so much time in me i should invest like money and my resources to make it as good as i possibly can and i try to get better with every episode that's why i last week just bought a camera to look uh, make it a little bit more uh, soothing it's not as bright it's a little bit more dark i have like a led light there i have now the, the best microphone i could find it's the it's the the, the shore uh from what our joe, joe rogan i think almost every big podcast uh, uses and these are all investments that i make for basically because people are willing to invest time in my podcast i have to pay back the the, this trust and this uh, time that people are uh, paying me forward so like um, uh, I'm also my soundproofing my sister I don't know if you saw the tweet of mine yesterday uh, the day before I have egg boxes standing here and uh, <laughs> I think blanket is coming down here so my voice is not like a reverb because my room is like a attic and so the, the 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 voice is really bad if I don't have those things. And um, I'm trying to invest more and more into the quality of the content because when people invest their time, I should invest in in the quality of the content. And Bitcoiners have a tendency to be to reward uh, hard work. Like proof of work is a big thing in the media. So if if you invest your time into producing a high quality product and this is recognized by the community, then the community will offer a lot of support back. So uh, I think your success is also a reflection of the fact that you're the, that the community is appreciating what you're doing, that they that there is an audience for your work, that it is like high quality. So. I wouldn't worry too much about the little technical details. At in the at the end of the day, what the reason people are following you is because they respect like the content and the people you're bringing on board, the effort you're making. You know, they're very low time preference, so they're okay with things taking a little bit longer. If in the end you're gonna deliver something that that's worth the wait. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's important to note that I'm really just getting started like i'm i'm the podcast is not even four months old or is it now four months old i think it's now exactly four months old because i started on 28th of november december january february april yeah march i'm i, I lost march it's five months old actually right now i forgot the march to to count uh yeah it's five months old exactly now and uh, I'm, I'm i'm really 
like I'm I'm humbled by 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 the feedback I got from the Bitcoin community. Uh, but I'm just getting like started. It's 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 fascinating for me that people are like signing up for channel memberships on YouTube uh, to pay me monthly. Uh, people are giving me money on value for value for fountain uh, and and all all those weird stuff for me that I cannot really comprehend. But people are actually paying for a free product that is out there uh, after the fact. So it's it's fascinating to see uh, the Bitcoin community rewarding, as you said. Uh, hard work and the proof of work and I'm, I'm doing my best but yeah, I'm, I'm not even a half year in so like I'm, I'm a, a Bitcoin podcast newbie and, and I'm, I'm trying to, to pay my way. I have one last question for you before we go. So it's similar to what you do. So you at the end of your episodes you ask your guests to uh, ask a question for the next guest. Mm. So my question for you was like what question has been the most interesting or what question would you wish they asked that they haven't asked? Something about the questions you asked, because I found that really endearing. I, I like that one. Um, first of all, I stole that from the diary of a CEO. Like this was not my idea. Uh, the diary of a CEO is a, a podcast outside of Bitcoin that I really like to listen to. Um, now there's a little less, but I really love to, to listen to it uh, last year. Uh, and uh, he just made the, the same thing that I'm making, he's making. I just copied it 100%. And I loved it so much that I was like, I have to copy that. I tried to put my own spin on it, but I did not like my own spin on it. <laughs> So I just copied it. Uh, and I also thought it is amazing for the Bitcoin community because it goes back to this blockchain thing where the guests are interconnected to each other, where the guest is pointing with the next with a question to the next guest, like in the blockchain, they're pointing to the next blocks. So I, I love that uh, that it's it's suiting so well. Uh, and yeah, but I, I just want to note that I just copied that and I, I love it. Uh, um, uh, what was the question? Uh, what's the most interesting question? Yeah, uh, or uh, one that you wish people would ask but they haven't, or so yes, which question would you like to highlight from that? From that, uh, I love the, the rudimentary questions like what is freedom, uh, that okay. came up, uh, or the, even the outside of Bitcoin questions are always like, for example. Um, uh, the question that I liked a lot is like, what is the daily habit that you love and would not live without uh, that one daily habit that you do? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is also an interesting thing that uh, sparks interesting conversations. Like basically, I actually like when they are asking uh, questions a little bit outside of Bitcoin because Bitcoin is well, well covered in, in my, my podcast usually. Uh -huh. uh, and... Uh, Usually, like when it's a Bitcoin question, uh, it's it's covered already before that, like uh, a little bit even. So when I see the question, obviously I know the question before we get in the interview. Uh, so I try to get around that question so it's not covered in the podcast. But sometimes it's hard because the, the guest gets where I, the guest gets. Like I, I don't try to, to guide the guests. I just try to be like the get the best side of, out of the guest as, as possible. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's fascinating for me to see that uh, uh, more and more questions are getting outside of Bitcoin. Uh, and then there are some questions uh, that are really technical. Uh, that's sometimes interesting. I think one question I also want to highlight, uh, that's why I now started to like not reveal who the next guest is to the guest. Mm -hmm. Like I uh, have like asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is mm -hmm. uh, uh, because uh, the um, uh, it, it, it was it was already misused as a <laughs> as a question that that uh, asked from from uh, the relay the social uh, he's the social media lead, uh, leaders from relay he knew the next guest uh, mm -hmm. and he was like I was asking for the next like why are you bold? <laughs> <laughs> and I, lo I loved it because they knew each other really good like they had a really friendly thing uh, going on they, they loved it and it was uh, he, we made a, a clip about that uh, but uh, for me I, I, that's why I started to not reveal uh, who the next guest is uh, to, to get it like fresh because when I reveal who the next guest is 
uh, then people think of this person and try to tailor a question to him mm -hmm. and this is not like where it should go it should like be like completely completely new like why is uh, uh like what is freedom what's your daily habit like mm -hmm. um what else was in there but th there's like um a question that nobody asked till now uh, um nobody asked till now why bitcoin for some reason uh why bitcoin uh, why Bitcoin never, nobody ever asked on, on the podcast, why are you actually in Bitcoin? But it's it's fair because I, I usually cover that in the podcast. Uh, and uh, the thing that I like to have, like I started asking that a lot of my guests uh, and nobody ever asked that in the, in the in the in the end of the in, in the end routine of the question uh, i started to ask the guests what are you currently really passionate about besides bitcoin uh, because i think bitcoiners are doing so many great stuff uh, and we can learn from that as a bitcoin community what they are doing outside of bitcoin uh, and from that so that's like to the end i'm more and more getting this question in not with every guest uh but with more and more and nobody ever asked that because i think it's an interesting question to think about okay right now what are you learning what your audiobooks your podcasts what are they about because this is changing for me all the time like like one year I had a whole different uh, thing that i'm currently right now because right now i'm starting a podcast obviously i'm, I'm listening a lot to like uh, what is important for podcast? Uh, how do I uh, make like a brand out of a podcast? How can I scale it? What is personal branding? Like, because I, I have to know all about that to get the Bitcoin message out there. Uh, the bet we coming back to the, the earlier things that we said about the, the, the best way to orange build people, the best way for me to get the, the Bitcoin message out there is if my podcast is really big. Mm -hmm. Like as long as like I would not care too much about that my podcast is really big, but that's the best way for me to get the Bitcoin uh, message out there, and maybe even so big that it's a little bit outside of of, of Bitcoin. That's why I I started. Uh, this also didn't cover a lot. I started uh, naming the podcast the Bitcoin Path, uh, and then I decided after like ten or twenty episodes to not give it any name just name the podcast nothing like it's just robin sire it's like just my name and i made this decision really uh consciously because i want to talk about anything i'm currently passionate about i think the next 10 years will be about bitcoin the next 10 years of the podcast will be primarily about bitcoin mm -hmm. uh, but even if it goes beyond bitcoin because at some point uh it's sometimes hard to, to think about that, but at some point, Bitcoin will be boring because everybody will use it. It will be the base layer of our financial system. Uh, and it will be like we are talking about the TCP IP protocol. Who cares what the TCP IP <laughs> protocol is now? Everybody uses it. Everybody, when you send like messages on, 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 on the phone, when you send anything, uh, uh, there is always the TCP IP protocol somewhere connected with it but nobody has a podcast about it because it's boring and bitcoin will also be boring <laughs> i i actually asked this myself this question like a similar question I, and it comes to that this idea that bitcoin is just money so like sometimes i struggle with this idea because my daughter is like mom why are you always talking about bitcoin are we gonna go see your bitcoin friends <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, okay, what's going on? But then I'm, but it is a little bit because it's a new technology. We're like redefining what money means. So it's kind of fair that it's about Bitcoin because I do wonder sometimes like Bitcoin is just the Bitcoin is just the tool that we are going to use to do all kinds of other things. So right now we're really like focused on the tool. But really, like, what is the tool allowing us to then go and do? So yeah. I love that you're taking that approach. That's a great uh, take on that whole situation. Yeah, I, I just could not decide a name. And I was like, then let's not name it at all. <laughs> my, 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 my YouTube uh, is just Robin Sire. My thing is also Robin Sire. Like, you can find it with Robin Sire. Uh, there's actually, when you... Uh, Google Robin Sire podcast. There is another Robin Sire podcast coming up. It's called Robcast. 
uh, it's it's not my current podcast. It was a podcast of my past. It's in German, uh, and I cannot delete it for some reason. Uh, <laughs> that was one of my questions, but I, I didn't like kind of the the. We still have a, a minute to to maybe discuss it. Why do you choose to do English instead of uh, German, for example? Ah, uh, that's uh, I get that asked a lot uh, in the comments. Uh, people even say like, "You, sh I should do German because mm -hmm. for some reason they want to to have it in German." But I don't care for that, uh, and I uh, don't care for that specific reason because I think we have a lot of great content creators in uh, the German area. We have Block Trainer, we have Sunny Degree, we have really like I think five, six Bitcoin only podcasts in German. I don't know how it is in Spain and other languages, but in German we're really great represented. There is no need that, that everybody, like there's always a need for more stuff and we can always saturate the market more and there can always be another Bitcoin podcast in that language. And it's the more, the better. Yeah. But there is not like, oh, there's not one. We even have Nico Yilch. I completely forgot about them. He's, uh, he's Austrian. He's doing a great job. Uh, and uh, there's so many great Austrian, German, Swiss content creators that are doing only German content uh, where I'm like, it's not like there is a, a hole in the market and there's no Bitcoin podcast. Like Nico Yil, he invites really cool people. He has an in-person studio. He's doing extremely professional. He's now partnering up with a football team in Austria. He's like on a whole nother level. He's a really good block trainer. I love him. He's on the um, uh, Bitcoin stage also in Prague. Uh, like there are really good people in Germany, in German. And there are also a lot, a lot more uh, in English than in German. But there, there are really great people in English also. So for me, uh, I got to take this decision freely because I know there are a lot of great Bitcoin podcasts in English. There are a lot of great Bitcoin podcasts in German. So there is no need for me to fill any hole in any market really i just can find my own space and uh, i worked in the company where i primarily uh, talked uh, uh, english uh, with my clients because my client was in in, in france uh, i have an indian girlfriend uh, which uh, she does not know uh, german she, she understands some german but she i cannot really speak german uh, so i talk with her every day in english because i also don't know hindi <laughs> uh, uh, even though i'm trying to learn a little bit but it's not an easy language for me mm -hmm. uh, so we talk every day in english i have like 50 percent of my friends are from like america england from wherever uh, so i talk with them uh, english and not german like even like some of my friends are english and not german so for me english it's not mother language level, but I can speak it without thinking about it. And I even uh, went on a kind of an English standard in my private life, where when I had set up a new system, when I set up a new phone, everything is English. Like everything that I set up is, is in English. Uh, and then I only was like, um, what, what, what do I want to do? Because I can speak in German and I can speak in English. There, there's no difference for me in there. And then there's two aspects that uh, are now was were deciding for me. The first aspect is not all German is German. Uh, if I speak in the Austrian dialect, some German don't even understand this. <laughs> uh, and it's uncomfortable for me to speak in the high German's language. Mm -hmm. uh, that the high standard of, of German, it's like the, the German that the Germans speak mm -hmm. and the German that the Austrian speaks is a little different, even though the basis is the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel more comfortable in English than the high standard of German. And if I have a German speaking podcast, I probably have to speak in the high uh, uh, high language of, of German, because then like Germany does not understand me, the Swiss does not understand me, then it's just an Austrian podcast and it's really small. Uh, and uh, this was one of the smaller aspects, but the bigger aspects is um, I want to talk with people all over the world. I don't only want to talk with uh, oh, Austrians. 
And this is the most uh, important part. Because if I have a German uh, um, podcast, we are not uh, there yet with AI translation where we can real-time translate it really good. So mm -hmm. English is the, the kind of the middle standard. Uh, and when you only talk with German and Austrians, like Germans, Austrians, Swiss, they are in the like Western civilization. They think the same way, kind of. They have a, a similar way of living. Obviously, people are different, but uh, you get where I'm going. Like they're in a similar region. So I had Indians on, I had Africans on, I had uh, uh, people from America on, Australia on, Canada on. I had so many different uh, parts of the world already on my podcast that I did not want to miss out. And only 10%, right around that number, of my podcast are actually German-speaking people that I forced to speak English with me, <laughs> even though some of them did not like it. Uh, but uh, I forced them to do it because... I want to have this Bitcoin standard. I might, I might, uh, if I uh, if I have a great Bitcoin English podcast, I might do a second channel. Uh, and either if AI translation is good, translate all my podcast episodes in, in, in German with AI so people can easily get it because there are some Bitcoiners that are not comfortable with hearing English uh, or just don't know English that well and I want to uh, get them access to my English ones or even if AI translation is not good I might just start uh, interviewing some of the Germans again in German for an, uh, a second channel but I probably don't do that I probably do the AI translation uh, but it's it's a possibility but right now I'm just focused on the English podcast and doing that and the biggest reason is for me speaking with the guest uh, all over the world yeah, your decision process was a little bit different for me, uh, uh, from mine. I think it's very interesting how you came to that decision. And uh, because you're focused in interviewing people and English is like a more universal language that you can use to communicate with different people. I think for me, it's a little bit different because... Uh, with Spanish, it's a little. It's not like with German. There isn't so much high quality content specifically about Bitcoin in Spanish. There are some like good Bitcoin um, podcasters and BTC sessions. Just put out a little seminar in Spanish. I was quite uh, impressed. <laughs> but I I think in the when it comes to Spanish, there is kind of a hole in the market. Um, and it's not just for money reasons, it's more so for educational reasons, like there is a void that isn't being filled in terms of providing a service to these communities that they can access like some resources and get informed about the tools and the culture and the technology in Spanish. The, the part that is like hard for me, that is kind of why you picked English, is that it's very hard to bring people on your podcast to interview them in Spanish because there isn't that many Spanish speaking people who are like at that level that will be like a, a Natalie Brunel in Spanish, you know? So I've been thinking of ways of delivering this information to the Ibero-American community, different like strategies to make it. I think uh, AI translation will be soon really good. And I think it will be uh, consumable and it will be really good like maybe in a year, maybe in five years. I don't know what the time span is. I even saw some some bigger podcasts already experimenting with that and offering the English podcast uh, in two or three uh, other languages on different channels with AI translations. Uh, I mean, you have to spend money on that. There are tools, they're working a lot in usual, uh, utilizing a lot of uh, processing power, so they are not inexpensive. Uh, but... I think at some point, it doesn't matter what language you're uploading, the user of, let's say, YouTube can just choose, oh, I want to consume that uh, in my local language in Spanish, I want to use it in French, in, in, in German, in whatever. And YouTube does from the source to every other language. I don't know if we're there in 10 years, 20 years, or five years, or probably not one year. Uh, but I think at, at some point, language does not matter that much because AI translation and innovation tools are just that good with, in, in, with translating to every language. Yeah, and I think it's also about speaking the person's language, like not their actual language, but their language culturally and their language financially, because I think 
the reason why it's easy for you to speak English or German is because between the Americans or the British or the Germans or the Austrians, there's going to be a huge overlap in terms of the tools that are available, the resources that are available, the points of view are going to be similar, similar life experiences. And that doesn't translate very well for South Americans. South Americans don't feel like mm, represented sometimes in those discussions and those experiences. So I think more so than the literal language, the reason why AI can't really fill that gap it can at a technical level, but it, it can't really fill the gap because you need the the person to be communicating in terms of life experiences that those audience members can also relate to. But yeah, it'll be very interesting to see like where this whole AI future goes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was uh, I was just talking obviously about the language itself, like yeah. just like the words translated. So like uh, the same thing that basically the American series are doing with all the different languages, where they just have someone speaking over them. Uh, so like uh, I don't know the Big Bang Theory, for example, from America, there was a German German version version of that where some actual German person is speaking over that and and doing the jokes also differently and stuff like that. So I think we will get to that kind of a level where AI uh, can do it as good as a human uh, can translate it. Uh, because I'm also like fascinating when I, I switch sometimes with ChatGPT in Austrian dialect and he's like, speak with me as you would be someone from this Austrian small region. And I'm like, what? He's actually texting exactly as an Austrian would do. Uh, so I think just at a language level we will be uh, there. Then it will be interesting if AI can also like translate jokes and stuff like that because as you said a joke in america is different than a joke in india and is different than a joke in austria is different than a joke in in latin america so that will be interesting to see if they can uh, have a similar joke that also latin americans uh, uh, see but I have no clue, honestly. <laughs> I just, I just hope that at one point I press a release and my English podcast gets to everybody and everybody understands it. But I'm just hopeful. <laughs> All right. Um, why don't we close? Since we didn't um, answer the question, why Bitcoin? Why don't you we close with a little statement of why you think people should Bitcoin? Why Bitcoin? There are two aspects to it. The, the first one is the one that people in the West are really concerned about is number go up technology. They want to have more financial gain from it. And yes, you will have this 100% uh, Bitcoin will rip uh, all other assets apart in the next 10 years. It will be not funny. Uh, uh, people uh, people will attack Bitcoin because they will be envy of it. Uh, people will attack Bitcoiners because they will be envy of Bitcoiners. Uh, and people will be extreme. Bitcoin will be extremely high performing asset over the next ten, maybe even twenty years, uh, because we are just seeing like we have this three percent. Uh, adoption rate and once we hit may, maybe like at five six percent uh, number can vary depending on what metrics you use but once we hit this 10 percent like this s curve adoption uh, it will take maybe 10 years from 10 percent till we hit to, to the 80 90 percent so uh, this complete fomo this complete uh, price appreciation level uh, will hit sooner than most people think and harder than most people think uh, and even bitcoiners i think even me uh, we are not ready for the enorm price appreciation that's why i'm saying so much get self custody be ready for it uh, exchanges will be rock pulled uh, try to be be as self sovereign as you possibly can and then the, the second aspect to this is freedom go up technology uh, and this is for everybody <laughs> Uh, the, this is for everybody that is concerned about uh, their government maybe uh, trying to limit their freedom uh, in financial transactions. Uh, maybe they are concerned about uh, institutions uh, trying their uh, freedom in, in some sort. This is the part where you should really get passionate about. The first part you can also do with 
with stock investing, maybe picking some stocks or investing in your own company or something like that. But what you cannot do is the second part, freedom grab technology. Uh, it's it's something that is freeing so many people uh, from uh, from from different countries where they obviously ob all of a the sudden they can give money to someone. Uh, I think a big part was also Canada. The Canadian trucks. This was a, a huge. Uh, part of the Bitcoin history for me because uh, this showed people that a crowdfunding only works if you do it with Bitcoin tools. If you do bit, uh, crowdfunding, uh, so decentralized crowdfunding with fiat tools, they will freeze the assets. If mm -hmm. they do it with Bitcoin, with privacy in mind, with self-custody in mind, they cannot do anything from it. And they even froze bank accounts from people that just gave uh those canadian truckers money and i i don't care what you think about the canadian truckers on what side you're politically on i don't care but it should never be uh, an attack on the person that just wants to support financially a pol political group uh they should never be frozen from the uh, assets like this the 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 financial energy of a person is their life's energy to a certain extent and you should never as a political group uh, attack that but they will attack it and it's just a matter of time till, till you are on the wrong side of government or you in the uh, in the on a country where you are on the wrong side of government so why not protect uh, yourself from that if you also get the free uh, number grab technology like you get both in one thing uh, and i think this is the, the short uh, short elevator pitch that I usually give to people uh, if, if they've asked me why Bitcoin. And then there's usually like 20 things that they think that Bitcoin isn't working on coming. And uh, then I'm saying, okay, uh, if, if, if you're not convinced, uh, go verify yourself, go study yourself. I don't care if you get Bitcoin. If you don't get Bitcoin, it benefits me because then the adoption is slower, then I can buy more. I'm 25. I want to buy a lot. Of, I want to buy a lot of Bitcoin. I don't want to be rich now. I want to be rich when I'm 65 years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah, give us more time to stack stats. And also there's this phrase where it's like people buy Bitcoin at the price that they deserve. So if they reject it now and have to buy it later at a higher price, it's kind of like you brought it upon yourself. So that that creates a little friction, but it's a very hard truth to swallow. What hundred percent? And yeah, I said like three years long. I said Bitcoin is a scam. I could picked up so many bitcoins. <laughs> I don't even want to think about how many more bitcoins I would have to uh, compared to I have now. I'm like always looking at my stack. I'm like, oh shit. This is this, this, this is too small. I have not enough Bitcoin. <laughs> Everybody's celebrating the halving, and I'm over here like, why are you celebrating? Go. <laughs> Bitcoin ETFs, cancel them. Let's have it in ten years. Only people who have too much Bitcoin are celebrating the halving. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I'm really glad we ended with that question because I love this. I had never heard it put in the in the words of freedom go up technology. I really love that we ended that way. It's a great um, little tagline for the future. Thank you for, for having me on. It was a pleasure. I don't know. I think we talked over two hours. Uh, yeah. something like it was it was really really cool thank you for for hosting me and thank you for listening so much to to my stuff it was a great honor to be on and i definitely will have to, uh, have to have you on on my show also like i would love to to host you definitely i'd love to come and i'm really glad that you came on the show and that you shared all so, like about your life and how you got into bitcoin that was all really fun to listen to and that you let us in to what you've been doing and how you got here, that's all really valuable because, I mean, we all take a different path and we can learn from each other's paths. So I'm really happy to have had you in the show. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Danny.